has a, a, a history, long history in Cuba that I was not aware of that there's really no book that talks about marriage in, in Cuba. So I, I found that interesting. So I wanted to share that with you guys. I think we'll wait a, just a minute or so. Um, but I will have some resources for you as well that you may not be aware of. Uh, Martha from the Cuban Genealogy Club Yesterday, if you were on that meeting, she went through their website and she talked a lot about their uh, sources that they have. And they have a lot of sources, including a lot on uh, marriage records uh, as well. They have um, links to different sites that have um, marriage records. And anyway, I'll, I'll talk about that a little later. Um, and you may perhaps not be aware. I, I was not aware that there, there are, um, transcriptions of marriage records from Remedios, for instance. So um, that may be something that, that can help you in your research. Um, and perhaps something that we might be able to think about in the future, Brian, perhaps, is to transcribe some of, some of a little bit of what we have. You know, there might be a way around that, you know, so. Any particular parish church that you, anyone's looking for marriage records from? You know, Wada is mine. Wada's up there. Yeah. How's that, how's that priest, by the way? Have you, any word from what's going on in Guada? No, I have to speak to Atenas to see if the priest is back. Um, so I don't know. Okay. I'm hoping the lady that keeps the parish record, she had surgery and she helped me get some documents. So I need to find out if she's back. I need um, records from Pinar del Rio. Yes, we all need Pinar, Pinar del Rio. So do I. <laughs> <laughs> what parish? Uh, any particular parish? That I don't know. Um, I'm, I haven't done a lot of work on my uh, Cuban side because there just hasn't been a lot there uh, until I found my great-grandmother's um, Campeche, Mexico birth certificate that also listed um, her grandparents and her great grandparents who were from Pinar del Rio. Okay. So. Hmm. Um. Oh. All right. So I think we'll, we'll get started. Um, welcome to our next installment of um, Cuban genealogy, history, digital Cuba, um, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think we're all fascinated by Cuban genealogy and, and history and certainly part of what I want to do today and present to you is some of the historical context behind these records that, you know, most of us have, have seen all the time. I know, you know, I, I take them from, for granted sometimes and I just look to see who the person who my ancestor is, when they got married, you know, wh what their parents' names were so I can get their last names, I can go further back. And so I kind of just want that information. And sometimes I really don't uh, stop to think about really the, the, the history behind all of this. And in, in doing um, some of the research for this presentation, which by the way, I lost uh, just a couple of hours ago. Um, and I had to redo, redo it from scratch, so it, it is what it is. Um, but we, you know, we'll definitely talk about most of what I wanted to talk about. Um, but I, I did not realize that there are a lot of other records um, that can be accessed if, uh, if you travel to Cuba or perhaps Spain uh, related to such things as like dowries um, and whatnot and other dispensations. So we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, a little later on. Brian, is there anything you wanted to say? No, we just welcome everybody. This will be our last for, uh, I think, a couple of weeks. 
We might do uh, another one on Cologne Cemetery, and then Rich had an idea for another one, maybe in uh, July or August. Yeah. Okay, so we'll get started. So today we're going to talk about marriage in Cuba. Um, just kind of a brief overview of Cuba's early history, which uh, a lot of you may know. Um, Diego de Velazquez is sent to conquer Cuba in 1511. He, he, he and about 300 men set out from uh, La Española, which today is the Dominican Republic. And between 1511 and 1515, they found what are known as the, the famous Siete Villas, right? Havana, Puerto Príncipe, Bayamo, Baracoa, Trinidad, Santo Espíritu. Um, and of course, in this group, men, as you can expect, formed a, a disproportionate part of these expeditions and as such are gonna really constitute a majority of, of the population of early Cuba. Um, even though there was a royal order that permitted and even encouraged these men to bring their wives <clears throat> with them from Spain. Um, and we're really gonna see this is a departure from the other types of colonization that you're gonna see uh, by the French, the British, and the Dutch, which are not necessarily going to bring over their wives and are going to um, really be, you know, uh, they're going to intermarry uh, on a much more, um, uh, are gonna, with much more frequency than you're gonna see in the Spanish colonies and particularly uh, in Cuba. Um, so nevertheless, we, we see between 1509 and 1519, there were about 308 Spanish women that were identified as passengers to Indias. And Indias, uh, of course, means really anywhere um, where the Spanish went in the New World, uh, and, and Cuba was considered part of Las Indias. So between 1508 and 1519, we already see that there are about 308 Spanish women. A survey from 1534 <laughs> that I found um, from Trinidad and Santi Espíritos, however, um, listed that out of 17 residents, five were married to Spanish women, five were married to indigenous women, and two were married to mestiza women, and five were not married. Um, so what that tells us is that there was early, um, there were early marriages between Spanish men and indigenous women, even though the Tainos are going to eventually die out in, in Cuba. Um, nevertheless, early on, um, some of the men did marry indigenous women and produce um, mestizo children. So throughout the next few decades, Havana is going to become uh, very valuable to the Spanish crown as kind of a transport hub uh, for ships that are heading north to Spain uh, from South America. They're essentially bringing all, all the gold from South America up, back up to Spain. And so Havana is going to become very valuable as this kind of in-between uh, point. Um, it's not going to be the richest colony. It's not going to have um, the culture, the early culture, the education, the institutions that places like Mexico and Peru have. But nevertheless, Havana is going to become very valuable for its geographical uh, position. And it's from Havana that Pedro Menendez de Aviles is going to set out in 1562, and he's going to uh, found the city of St. Augustine. Um, really is kind of a, an effort to ward off the, the French who have been raiding in, in, in Florida, uh, they also tried to raid in Havana, uh, but the, the French are really going to try to have establish a, a foothold in, in Florida, and so the Spanish kind of want to ward that off. Um, and so the Spanish, there's a, a famous massacre of, of French uh, in, up in uh, northern Florida, and uh, the Spanish are going to establish the city of St. Augustine as uh, to, to really have a firm colonial uh, footprint in, in Florida. Um, Right away, you're going to see that marriage is going to become kind of a strategy for many of these early families to, uh, to build alliances, to consolidate alliances, to, to then later consolidate their privileged positions in society. Um, 
But one thing that is especially confusing for us as genealogies or uh, genealogists early on uh, is the fact that reconstructing these marriages and families is, is difficult because last names changed on records. Um, we see Lucia, the daughter of Martin Recio and Catalina uh, Mar uh, Marquez, appears as Lucia Recia in the marriage registry, then as Lucia Marquez in the baptism of her son in 1596, and then the year later as Lucia Recio in the baptism of her daughter Maria. Um, so last names are going to change, uh, especially during, during this kind of earlier time period. Um, you have another example of a woman by the name of Melcora, right? And she's the daughter of Melcor Gomez Buitón and Luisa de Salazar. She's sometimes referred to as Doña Melcora. Sometimes she's Doña Melcora de Buitón. Sometimes she's Doña Melcora de Salazar. So it makes it challenging for historians to kind of reconstruct this, this early group. And then we have the wife of Francisco Perez de Borroto, which I know some of us, he's one of my ancestors. Francisco Perez de Borroto was um, in Havana quite early. Um, I think 1555 we have him in, in Havana and he uh, was a member of the Cabildo. Um, and his wife is registered as Juana Soto on the occasion of the baptism of their son Juan in 1596. Then she's listed as Juana de Rojas in her marriage, which takes place a year earlier. Um, so uh, you're going to see um, kind of these last names uh, pop up in different machinations and, and different ways. What also makes it harder to reconstruct this group is that we don't have marriage records or really any type of sacramental records for this early period up until 1584. Um, there were, and I have no, I haven't been able to prove this, but there apparently were early church records, they think from about 1519. And what it, it's, it's thought that the French burned them when they invaded one of their um, invasions, probably in the 1550s, but apparently there were early records, um, early baptismal and early marriage records, which tells us then that there were marriages you know, being performed very early on, even, on, even though we only have them documented and we can access them starting 1584. So marriage and marriage alliances are gonna play a key role in the making of Havana's local landed elite, which isn't just gonna be limited to the elites. We're gonna also see newcomers are going to be able to marry into, uh, into these families. Um, usually they'll have some sort of royal service or they participate in, in commerce. Um, nevertheless, they're going to be able to enter this elite through marriages. So it's kind of a strategic way of, of basically climbing the social ladder. Um, and this, of course, I'm referring to men climbing the social ladder. So men would marry uh, up. Um, so a small group of families in the late 1500s exercised significant control over local affairs. Um, the Cabildo or the town council was a family affair. It was basically the same families that ran it. Um, which meant that they could easily obtain lots and farms for their relatives, and they did. They basically controlled the distribution of land, especially between 1550 and, and 1610. To give you an idea of how much control this group had, uh, the 32 councilmen obtained 187 urban lots and farms from themselves, particularly the Rojas, I know a lot of people have Rojas as a name, the Sotos, who were also known as the Sotolongos. So if you have a Soto, he could also be a Sotolongo or vice versa. Um, the Rojas obtained 51 concessions and the Sotolongos uh, uh, retained about 23 concessions and they married together. So the Rojas and, and Sotolongos kind of um, brought their families together and, and really amassed more power as a result. The Recios, which were also a, a big family, um, received 29 lots. Another one of these early uh, alliances, uh, one of the branches 
of the Rojas family was led by Alonso de Rojas and Diego de Sotolongo. They were actually brothers, but they could use whatever last name uh, they wanted to. And so they often use different last names. So Alonso de Rojas and Diego de Sotolongo were actually brothers and they had settled in the village around 1540. They settled in Havana. And again, this group is really gonna build its power and it's gonna gain influence through advantageous marriages. So we have Catalina de Rojas, who's the daughter of Alonso and Juana, marries Pedro Suarez de Gamboa, who was a powerful and prosperous landowner, who was the son of what is probably considered one of the richest men in Havana. And, and that was Alonso Suarez de, de Toledo. Francisco Perez de Borroto's daughter, Beatriz is going to marry Martin Calvo de la Puerta. So that kind of starts that uh, family. Um, Calvo de la Puerta is another um, very long, uh, has a long line in, in, in Cuba uh, and particularly in Havana. And we'll talk a little bit more uh, about them later. Um, the Recios were also uh, lucky enough to marry into the Calvo de la Puerta family. And um, Kinship ties had a lot to do with it. So both families were from this small town named Cumbres Mayores in Andalusia. Um, so frequently people would marry uh, into other families that were from their same town. Um, we have an interesting story, Anton Recio, who is really kind of the, uh, the patriarch, the first in the line of the, of the Recio family. He's known as, as Anton Recio el Viejo. Uh, and he had a child with an indigenous woman um, who was named Juan. And Juan is going to now become the patriarch of the Havana branch. Um, Anton Recio, uh, el, el Viejo, is going to have a nephew by the name also of Anton Recio, known as El Mozo. Um, and he is going to marry into the Sotolongo family. Uh, he marries Isabel Sotolongo Gonzalez, and it's their son, Jacinto. Recio Sotolongo, who's going to move to Camagüey and kind of establish that branch of the Recios from, from Camagüey. So there's two major branches of the Recio family. The one that was led by the illegitimate son, Juan, and then the one led by the nephew, Anton Recio, in Camagüey. So I want to talk a little bit about the first books of marriages. Um, again, according to some sources, and I haven't found definitive proof of, of this, there were earlier sacramental books that were uh, burned by Dutch and French pirates in the mid 1500s. In 1555, Havana had a small little church really made of like um, a very, very rudimentary. Um, and that is burned in 1555 by Jacques Sore. Um, and they're really not going to build another church. They're going to kind of take a while on that. And they're not going to uh, build, rebuild the church until 1577. Um, so Havana's marriage records, which are the earliest records that we have in the Cathedral of Havana, start in 1584 and goes until 1622. And those records, as probably a lot of you are aware of, are available in, on the Vanderbilt website. Um, I have a picture of them there. It's actually, um, they're also transcribed, which is very helpful. So here we have um, Catedral de La Habana, of course, starts in 1584, that's available. Remedios the first two books of marriages are available on the Cuba Gen uh, Club website, Cuba Genealogy Club website. Um, this is, these are just kind of some of the first dates. So you kind of have an idea of how this progressed. Guanabacoa, uh, Libro Uno from 1670 um, to 1715. Perhaps that might be transcribed and, and shared in the future. Um, we also have Espiritu Santo, 1674. That's actually 1728, so not uh, 1828. And then Santo Cristo del Buen Viaje, the, that first marriage book uh, is 1692 to 1718. Santo Ángel Custodio, 
The indexes for that first book are available on the Cuban Genealogy Club website. And then of course we have Matanzas and that first book of marriages is also available on the Vanderbilt University website. Standard marriage records included usually the name of the couple, where they were from, their parents, where their parents were from, names of a couple of witnesses. And as we're gonna talk about later, expedientes are really the way to go if you are able to obtain an expediente because it has a wealth of information um, about your ancestors. Um, this was kind of a uh, little study that was done from, use, from those uh, marriage records, from the first marriage records in the Catedral de La Habana, uh, kind of talking about the origin of the um, early residents of Havana. And as you can see, 77%, this is, this is all data taken from those marriage records. 77% were Spanish. Um, majority of them, as were most of the early conquistadors, were from Andalusia. Um, Canary Islands were definitely representing there at 23%. Uh, and then Castile also had a sizable portion. There were also some Portuguese that were in that early group, so about 8.4%. Um, so endogamy is a term that is used to describe the tendency for people to marry within their own community. Um, inbreeding is consanguinity in the extreme. So that refers to when people are very closely related. So that would be kind of a consanguinous relationship to the first degree. First degree means that you're marrying your, parent, your father, your mother, a sibling, um, or a grandparent. So obviously that was prohibited outright. Um, but normally uh, the degree and the frequency of consanguinity that we have, and we all I'm sure have some of it, um, don't really create significant genetic weaknesses, um, but it was actually a, a practical necessity, right? There weren't as many people um, in, these, in these towns, especially a lot of the smaller towns. And so it was kind of a practical necessity Sometimes you had to marry your first cousin. Um, uh, without it, we, you know, we, we, they wouldn't have been able to really find marriage partners. Um, so this is gonna actually become really important in Cuba, I think later on in the 19th century when African slaves uh, are in really imported uh, en masse. Uh, and at one point, actually African slaves are going to constitute a slight majority of the prop population. So the Spanish, um, the, the Cuban, white Cuban Creoles and the Peninsulares are really going to um, have to reckon with that and are going to determine that, that they have to uh, increase the Spanish population either through immigration or uh, marrying amongst themselves. Um, so this is gonna become a, a necessity. We're gonna talk a little bit more about it later as well. Um, so these endogamous marriages, however, are taking place already in the late 1500s, and they're joining two important clans like the Rojas and the Recios. Uh, we saw this when one of the founding members of the Recio family, uh, who did not have children with his wife, and he passed the fortune to his illegitimate child, Juan, um, who, who is described as, uh, by the governor uh, as the son of an Indian. Um, so Juan is going to become a full member of the elite, and he's also going to hold public office. Um, some of the newcomers were allowed into the group. Again, like someone like a Juan Recio is allowed into this group because of their standing or because of their wealth. Um, so so Juan's, um, Juan Recio, who, who was a mestizo, uh, was able to marry to, to, into a wealthy family. Um, and the dowry from that bride was perhaps not as generous as it might have been. So it was kind of seen as uh, Juan accepted it uh, kind of as a way of being able to marry into that family. Um, you're gonna have newcomers, immigrants like Bernardo de Quiroz from Asturias, who was going to marry into lines like the Recios. He actually marries Juan Recio's daughter, uh, Maria. Um, parents are going to make arrangements for the marriages of their children. 
they're going to be very strategic and they're going to carefully select and negotiate these these um, these arrangements. Uh, there's a case that I found of a Catalina Sanchez, who's the widow of Melchor Rodriguez, and she's going to agree to marry off her daughter at nine years old. Um, so what they do is essentially they sign kind of like a little like a promissory note, which is known as an esponsal, which is essentially kind of a, a, a promise note, uh, like, you know, we used to have in my day, like promise rings. Uh, so that, that's essentially what it was. And a lot of times there was something given like a ring or like a handkerchief um, as kind of a token to kind of seal the deal uh, to, you know, to, to make that marriage arrangement. Later on, we're going to see that notaries are going to start to keep track of these esponsales, because sometimes a person's word is not going to be enough. We're going to see that happen more in the 16 and 1700s, where, where these are actually going to be, you know, these esponsales are going to be notarized. So talking about dowries, um, parents are going to use dowries to select appropriate husbands for their families. Um, women of the upper stratum are usually given dowries by their parents, um, and this is going to guarantee the financial viability of the couple. Um, large dowries allow parents to negotiate favorable marriage arrangements, uh, and it would impose their choice not only on, on the children, but on their future sons-in-laws. Usually these future sons-in-laws lacked financial means and they were not independently wealthy. Um, there were about 134 dowries that have been found registered in the notarial records of Havana between 1578 and 1610. Um, some of these I found in this book that I have on the right, um, which I found by luck at University of Miami. They're actually giving them away. Um, they're very hard to purchase. It's a set of three. I only have the first two. I, they're not available on Amazon. I mean, you can check. They're actually great um, resources for looking up all kinds of other um, contracts and all, all kinds of other documents. But there are some dowries listed in there uh, as well. Um, you can also find a lot of these dowries in the Archivo Nacional de Cuba um, under the section Protocolos Notariales de La Habana and then under that the Escribanía Regueira. Uh, so you're going to find um, dowries in there. What do these dowries consist of? So a majority included slaves, right? We kind of expect that in late 1500s, early 1600s. Most of them had household items, linens, clothing, jewelry, and most of them had cash, right? Cash is wonderful. Um, and this cash could include silver bars or uh, cash receipts. So these dowries are going to represent as well, it's important because it, it represents um, an instance in which a woman's legal personality was fully recognized um, at a time when they really don't pop up in the records at all, you know, unless it's a baptismal certificate or a marriage certificate or a death certificate. Um, and so this is going to really kind of um, make them, uh, provide them the ability to engage in, possess property, perform legal acts. Um, the daughter, in fact, usually received a portion of the house in which her parents lived that belonged to her as an inheritance. Um, for instance, Doña Isabel de Gamboa from the Gamboa family received in her 1602 dowry half of the Stone family house plus half of most of the family properties, and that included sugar mills, atos, corrales, estancias. She also received about half of all of the slaves, so she received 22 slaves, and her dowry was among the largest uh, in Havana, worth over 130,000 reales, which at the time was, um, was quite a lot. Um, sometimes grooms would, could, would contribute to the marriage, mostly, um, uh, I mean, some of the time, um, but it was usually a financial contribution that by law could not exceed 10% of their assets. There were costs to getting married. In fact, there were a lot of costs. It was quite expensive. There were a lot of steps. Um, uh, 
marriage was <clears throat> seen as an obligation as a Christian, and uh, this is going to continue into the 1600s. Um, so a lot of these families that we kind of briefly mentioned are going to be extended throughout the 1600s, and they're going to continue to marry each other. We're going to have the Rojas, the Sotos, the Recios, the Calvo de la Puertas, the Perez de los Rotos, the Pedrosos, the Carreños, Sayas Basang, all of these families are going to continue marrying uh, with each other. And by the way, all of these families are in the Conde de Haruko book, um, which is also available uh, online. I just uh, downloaded them a few weeks ago, so they're all available. Um, so it talks a lot about these kind of early families. Now, even though parents wanted ideally to marry off their daughters, a lot of families of lesser means couldn't, couldn't really do it. They, they just didn't have um, large dowries. They would encounter difficulty obtaining a lot of these documents. Uh, it, was, it was quite expensive for most of the population. Um, the marriage, for instance, required the presence of a priest to sanctify the marriage. Then you needed a scribe to tie up any loose ends uh, from, from the dowry. So there were quite a bit of steps and a lot of kind of different people that you had to pay for different services related to your marriage. So in Havana, you're gonna see, especially in the 1600s, the foundations of religious foundations, which were known as orapias. And these foundations were established by wealthy men, obviously, to help distribute dowries to poor girls so that they could get married. It was considered an obligation. And if a woman did not get married, she had one other option. And that other option uh, was to, to go into a convent, to go into a religious convent. Um, so you either got married or you went into a convent. And a lot of women were sent to convents. And there was particularly this one convent where a lot of Cuban women were sent to in the Yucatan. Um, so it, it did happen. Again, history that I don't really see written about. You kind of really have to dig for it. Um, so uh, to give you an idea of what some of these obrapillas were like, um, Benito Suarez, in his will uh, from 1669, provides 500 pesos per capita to 12 poor girls. They still had to be daughters of honorable parents, right? Um, and uh, this is going to help them really kind of fund their dowries. You have uh, Ines de Yuste, who was from Jerez de la Frontera. And he was considered one of the richest men in Havana. And he helped to donate his fortune to charity that included a place where young female orphans could live. Um, and then with, you know, with the ultimate purpose of marrying them off. So this was considered something that was very uh, important. And then you have perhaps the most famous Obrapia, which you can see over on the right. And that building is still in Havana, uh, is still standing in, in old Havana. Um, and that is by Martin Calvo de la Puerta. Uh, and Ma Martin Calvo de la Puerta, um, in his will, established a religious foundation that was going to provide dowries for five women a year. Um, there were some conditions, though. The women had to be related to him. Um, but uh, nevertheless, it, it, was, it was, I think he, it, each year, he, the, this, his estate spent 5,000 uh, reales on providing the dowries from the, for these, these girls. Now, marriage was costly, and to know just how costly, um, I provided this, this price sheet here. Um, so you had to pay the notary public, A, to publish the decree, right? Um, because they had to publish something before you got married to let everyone know that you were marrying, so that if anybody had any objections, they could come forward with those objections. They also had to examine three witnesses, they had to take the couple's declarations. They would provide the license and they would provide the amonestacion, which was, is known as an admonition. Now, if you were enslaved, which obviously you would not want to be, the prices were reduced. Um, so you have prices for the Españoles and the free people of color was 38 reales for this, all of these services. And for the enslaved, it was 30. 
uh, and then for each additional witness, it would cost you four reales. Then you would have to pay whoever drew up the petition uh, four additional reales, and that was the same for everybody. Um, for another priest to publish the amonestacion, that was six reales. The masses were expenses. They had to give a lot of masses for this marriage. Um, so that was 32 for the Españolas and free people of color and 26 for the enslaved. Um, now, if you were in a rural parish, those costs were reduced so that then it became 26 for Españolas and 20 for slaves. And anything that was in, the, in rural Cuba that were rural parishes was known as Tierra Adentro. And that kind of started blossoming really the early 1600s, you're going to start to see some of these uh, um, uh, locations like Guanabacoa uh, and, and, and whatnot kind of start to, to um, take root. If you wanted to have your wedding at home, there was an additional cost. So there were, was an additional cost of four reales for, for everybody. And then you had to pay the, the vicar, right, for the whole procedure from the license to the marriage. And that was a cost of 32 if you were uh, an Espanol or a free person of color, and then 24 if you were enslaved. I don't know how my ancestors afforded that. I, I wish I knew more about, about that because I see that they all got married. Um, so there were ways around it, actually. There were efforts later on, and actually in the 1600s, by the church to further reduce this, those costs and in some instances do away with them altogether. Uh, so, so I think there was some sort of recognition that it was a lot. And so the, the, the church um, tried, to, tried to help um, ameliorate that. Um, these carefully planned marriages, you're going to see them um, continue into the 1700s. And now you're going to see all of these new, a lot of new names that we're familiar with, like the O'Farrils, um, the O'Reillys, the Luz, the Mirayas. Um, are going to come in. The O'Farril story is an interesting one. Ricardo O'Farril um, was a, uh, a man, Irish, well, he was actually from the island of Montserrat, uh, born to Irish parents. And he is going to come to Cuba um, with the South Sea Company, which was essentially um, a company that traded in slaves. So he was essentially a slave trader. Um, he's going to marry um, very high. He's going to marry uh, an Arrieta, the daughter of the governor. And he's going to start this long line of Ofarils. Um, the Ofarils in 1788 are going to um, be instrumental in establishing the church in Tapaste. Um, they owned a lot of land in that area um, and are, are going to um, found the church of Tapaste. As we talked about uh, before with endogamy, um, endogamy resulted, of course, from, from the prejudices and population scarcity and, and, and the fact that many of the island's residents in the interior could not afford all of the tramis, tramites and did not have uh, enough priests to perform marriages. Now, in Cuba, one thing that sets Cuba apart from a lot of Spain's uh, other colonies were that um, a majority of the island's population are going to be white, uh, uh, essentially. Um, of course, the indigenous population uh, has died out by the 1700s. There are a lot of African slaves. You're not going to really see the, um, the, the major uh, influx until the late 1700s and the 1800s. Um, so endogamy is going to become more uh, important. After the British occupation in 1763, Cuba is going to become Spain's colonial darling. Um, and between 1753 and 1800s, you're gonna see uh, over 4,400 marriages celebrated in Havana. And you're going to see really this phenomenon of immigrant men, mostly Spanish, marrying Cuban Creole women. It's going to become the, the, the pattern. And it's not only from the people in the upper ranks, you're going to see people also in the lower ranks are going to 
um, be, you know, you're going to see the, that, 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 that pairing of, of, the, of the Spaniard immigrant and, and a Cuban Creole woman. Um, one thing to note is that if you weren't as wealthy, parish priests were really less enthusiastic about documenting your relative's personal details. Um, so I, I know I have found that marriage entry that I, it has like two bits of information and then the one on top of it has all this information and I'm thinking, why, why? Um, so they maybe just didn't have enough, you know? Um, so the, the priest just decided to, to take the basic information. Um, what else do we have here? Uh, this is the part of the presentation that I wasn't able to put back together. Um, so in 1776, there's an important, of course, you know, Cuba at this time is, is, a, is a colony. Cuba is going to remain a colony of Spain, full colony until 1898. Um, and so really all of its laws, including family law, marriage laws are going to be, you know, whatever's dictated from Spain. And so Charles III, um, this is also the time of the Bourbon reforms. The Bourbon reforms were basically administrative reforms by the Spanish crown um, for the colonies to kind of try to streamline everything and to essentially exert more control over the colonies and to try to remove some of that control from the church. Um, in Cuba, the church, even though it was important, it wasn't necessarily as powerful as the church in other places, other colonies like Mexico and Peru in particular. Um, and so Charles III is going to promulgate what's known as the Real Pragmatica de Sobre Matrimonios. And the reason he does this um, primarily is because uh, he was horrified that his younger brother married far beneath the royal family. Um, so after 1778, um, challenges to the choice of one's marriage partner could come from the church, the government, one's superiors, from other family members, whether they were male or female. Um, if a couple dared to contract a marriage that offended community norms, um, some form of challenge to, to one's choice of a marriage partner could be virtually guaranteed. Um, and so he did this to try to um, limit marriage unions that were not equal. What does that also, that has major implications, of course, for any type of an interracial um, union. Um, and so you're going to see uh, a lot of um, partners have to, have to prove their lineage, have to prove um, their limpieza de sangre, um, which is also another document that you can find um, usually I mean, I have found them in the Archivo Nacional de Cuba. Um, so those are a lot, you know, more challenging uh, to find, especially online for, for your relatives. Let's see what we have here. Okay. So race is going to become a, a much, you know, more important factor in really everything in, in Cuba in the 19th century. More African slaves are, are imported, so whites are going to really feel um, this uh, urgency in trying to preserve their socioeconomic preeminence, especially uh, in light of the Haitian Revolution, right, which overturned that, that social order. Um, and so the Cubans want to avoid that happening in, in Cuba. And you're going to have the Bishop of Havana in 1858 is going to essentially acknowledge this. And he's going to say, this is a country in which the short number of its white population makes marriage with, with kinfolk common, particularly within the well-to-do classes. Um, so as I mentioned before, dispensations um, you're going to see a lot more of them during this time period, and they can be either consanguineous or uh, affinity. So sometimes a couple, if I have anything here, yeah. So sometimes a couple were not related by blood necessarily, but um, via a marriage in the family. So sometimes a, a man wanted to marry his deceased wife's sister. That was actually quite common. Um, I have a few of those. Um, and they would have to obtain a dispensation. Um, 
So that usually was a, known as what was a, a first grade affinity. So a first grade affinity was if you, if a man wanted to marry his sister-in-law. So that had to be a document drawn up. Um, if they want, if he wanted to marry, which was also very common, his wife, his, de his deceased wife's first, the wife had to be deceased. So let's just uh, clarify that. So the wife had to be deceased. Uh, if he wanted to marry his wife's deceased wife's first cousin, that was known as second grade affinity. Um, and he also had to obtain uh, a dispensation. Dispensations had to be obtained up to the fourth degree. Um, so even if you married your you know, wife's fourth cousin or third cousin, you had to obtain a, a, a dispensation from the church. Um, these were expensive. They usually ran uh, from 500 to 600 pesos at least. So really only the well-to-do families could contract such, mar such marriages. Um, and of course, those were probably the families that, um, that uh, their family interests would make uh, that type of a marriage much more desirable. Um, so a lot of these documents are usually, were usually compiled in what was known as an expediente, right? Um, prior to the celebration of a marriage, canon law, right? Canon law is church law as opposed to civil law. So prior to the celebration of the marriage, canon law is going, uh, imposed that a file had to be started that included the names, the origin, the age, the affiliation, whether they were single or widowed, racial status, and other information from the parties, um, in addition to requiring this to be publicly displayed. Um, and along with this, uh, if, there was, if there was a relationship of, of kinship that was consanguineous or where the, if there was an affinity in it, that also had to be uh, included in, in this file. These expedientes are gold mines um, because in many cases they include separate genealogical trees for the spouses. So I was able to find one that included, there was this wonderful genealogical tree. My, the, it was from 1813 right, the, the expediente. And so I was able to go all the way back to the 1600s just because of this family tree that was in this expediente. And this family tree was made in 1813. It was literally drawn like a family tree. So these are gold mines. These, you know, <clears throat> are a little more difficult to find, but not necessarily. You can find them. Um, most parishes, Got them here. So most Cuban parishes have them. I have seen them in places like Guanabacoa, in Guinness, Matanzas. They have them, but they usually only start after 1800. Um, if you're curious and want to look and see what it looks like, Vanderbilt University has them for, I've, I've seen them for Pardos y Morenos. I have not seen any for Espanoles, but you can kind of get an idea of what um, is included in it. Um, I found that Santo Cristo del Buen Viaje has expedientes going way back from 1694. This is a document that was drawn up many, many years ago. So I don't know if these books, if these expedientes still exist. Um, but nevertheless, that was what, um, that's when the expedientes started in Santo Cristo del Buen Viaje. Um, the Archivo Nacional, uh, also has a lot of expedientes, and as do the provincial museums in, in, the, in the province. So the Archivo uh, Histórico Provincial de Matanzas also has um, a lot of expedientes matrimoniales. Another place where you can find um, dispensations or data on dispensations, uh, as well as things like disputes between the church and state over marriage. And there were a lot of disputes between church and state, uh, church and state over, over marriage that, that went on actually into the Republican period of, of Cuba. Um, but these are some places where you can find these type of documents. Archivo Histórico Nacional de Madrid, 
under the section Ultramal. You can find it. Um, also, the Archivo del Consejo de Estado Madrid, uh, which may be on Pares. I'm not sure. I haven't had an, an opportunity to check, but I think these are the types of, of documents that may be available on the Pares website. If you go to the Archivo Nacional de Cuba or have somebody do research for you there, um, you can um, find documents such as this in these uh, fondos, the Fondo de Gobierno Superior Civil, the Fondo Gobierno General, Fondos de Asuntos Políticos, um, remember, a lot of these were military marriages. So in the 1700s, you have this huge influx um, and the growth of the military bureaucracy, especially in Cuba, because one of the places that the, the Spanish king wanted to fortify um, after the, the Sp uh, Spain lost Havana to the British, to the British and after the British occupation um, was Cuba in particular. Um, so there was this huge influx of military men. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, basically all of them married uh, Cuban Creole women. Um, and so um, a lot of these military marriages also had to go through um, uh, uh, kind of the bureaucratic process. And so a lot of this information is uh, in, in these particular fondos in the Archivo Nacional de Cuba under the headline Matrimonio. Um, there's also a lot of information on uh, parental descent, um, you know, parents who did not want to allow their underage children. And actually, um, children had to obtain permission, not even children, adults had to obtain parental permission up to the age of, in the case of women, I think it was 23. And in the case of a man, it was, I think, 25, so quite late. Um, so they have to obtain permission. So you're going to see a lot of these um, parental descents are, are in the archives as well, parental descents to interracial marriage. So the civil registry um, starts with the provisional law of civil registration in, in 1870. Actually, some Spanish registries date back to 1837. Um, and this is implemented in Cuba in 1885. These are great. This contains, even your basic entry contains at least a few pages, at least two, two and a half pages of information on, you know, on your, your ancestors. Um, you know, the downside is, of course, they only start in 1885. Um, but I have found a wealth of information on my grandfather, great uncles, where they lived, Kind of what they owned. Um, I mean, quite detailed information uh, on them and, and on their wives as well. In Spain, very easy, easy to obtain. They'll even make you a copy of it for free. Um, so, I mean, that at least has been my experience in the Spanish civil registries. You can even call them and they will send it to usually the Spanish consulate here in Coral Gable, well, if you're in Florida. Um, they will send it to the Spanish consulate in Coral Gables, and you can either pick it up or have it sent to you. So I just obtained marriage records from, from some Canarian um, ancestors uh, by, just by calling, um, and they did it all, and it was all free of charge. Um, now in Cuba, it's a little bit more <laughs> challenging, um, but certainly possible. Um, I, have I have gone to Cuba you know, and, and, and gotten these documents. Um, but yeah, it, that, you know, it, it depends on the person who is running that particular civil registry. Um, there are also, you know, researchers that can go to, to the civil registries uh, and, and obtain those documents. I've also uh, been able to do that. Um, and so this is a time period when you're going to see that marriage becomes, you know, this real kind of controversial issue between uh, the church and state. There's going to be this attempt in 1899 uh, to do away with the churches performing marriages. Um, and it was all going to be just the civil registry. And this is when the Americans actually uh, occupied Cuba in 1899. Um, the, the law did not end up passing, but it was quite a radical um, law that was being, um, that, um, was being pushed. 
And then 1918, which is quite late, divorce is finally uh, legalized in Cuba. So that's really what I have for um, history of marriage in Cuba. Um, you know, we um, have perhaps are going to transcribe some marriage records that we have um, and, and can perhaps make those available with the Cuban Genealogy Club, you know, for, for a parish, um, at least the first book. Um, does anybody have any questions on anything related to the history of, of, of marriage in Cuba or about marriage records? Rich, um, yeah. if, if I find a man marrying a woman that happens to be his niece, uh -huh. um, I was that, would be that was good. Yeah, that, yes, that would be consanguinous, consanguinous um, relationship of the second degree. So, so am I safe to assume that he, that this niece was uh, related to his deceased wife then by what you had said earlier? I, mm, I wouldn't assume. Um, no. I, I, would, I would guess that it was perhaps related to his sibling. I mean, that was, very, unfortunately, it was, it was quite common. Okay. But it could be that it was related to his, to his deceased wife, and that, but then it would be uh, affinity. To, of, the, of the second affinity of the second degree and then okay. it would be a consang if, if it was his siblings child which I, I think is probably more common then it would be a consanguinous dispensation of the second degree okay yeah. i'll double check thanks yeah that was quite common i found a lot of those yeah well i also have a um my great 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 grandmother that apparently she married someone and then maybe had one or two children but then apparently he may have died and then he she married somebody else that became like my great great grandfather so right. i have to figure out where the whole the whole thing is it's kind of weird because yeah. we never knew about that name so and there's different this like you said before there was different names but this is a different first name not the last name Right. So where where is this from? Wh where? Um, Colón. Oh, Mostly Colón. Iberbeja. Oh, okay. And what what year? I think the first marriage was eighteen sixty three, and the and the second one was eighteen seventy three. Okay. Let yeah, me so have there, my date. There should be expedientes for that. Yeah. Um. I gotta try to find where they are. So I'm. I may have to ask you that after the the uh, the presentation. Chance? Yeah, chances are it might be in Colón Church. Okay. Yeah. Now, will they do will they will they give you that as another question? You know, you know, because it's such a hassle. Um right. I, you know, sometimes they don't keep the expedientes as orderly as they keep the other books. Okay. Um so some you know, so it's a question of whether they have them there and whether they're willing to to look for that. You know, but it's possible. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh huh. Thank you. Okay, we have we have another question from Leia. If you want to unmute yourself, and then I can go through some of the questions that were put in the chat. So, I just have a question about the expedientes from um, from Guinness. Is uh -huh. that something that um, that you perhaps have a source, like as researchers who can go get that, or um, um, you wish privately? Yeah, uh, there is perhaps um, a person who might be able to, um, yeah, there might be a researcher who might be able to get that. I, I mean, I happen to know that they have them. Again, it all, it, it all, they have a lot of them. Um, and they're, I mean, they're thick, thick files too. Um, so yeah, who, 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 who just asked that? I can't see who it was. Who was that? Leia. 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 Pennsylvania. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, we can talk offline. And, okay. Sounds yeah. good. Uh -huh. Sandor, can you add, can you unmute and ask your question? Yes. Um, 
So I actually posted it in the chat too, but um, if you go through the Matanzas First Marriage book, which is online, and I've done some research in Guanabacoa, you also find a lot of women from the Canary Islands too. You know, if it wasn't uh, native, or I should say Creole women, Canary Islanders made a, a bulk of marriages too, and they tend to also marry their cousins and stuff. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, and there there were a lot of a lot yeah definitely a lot of Canarian uh, women. And the the other thing is it's not so much of a question. I was wondering if I could share my screen just to show an example of what you were talking about because I also see it in my tree. And I was there's um there's a line that I'm not necessarily a descendant from, but I was kind of surprised uh, that it's featured on the Cepero on the uh, uh, history of Cuban families uh -huh. and. It's a marriage between Francisco Cepero y Fuentes and Josefa de Prado de la Rivera, which I should mention, she is baptized in Guanabacoa in 18, uh, 1744 as Josefa de Prado y Cepero. The mom was Agustina Cepero. So sometimes they show up as Cepero, sometimes de la Rivera. It's because yeah. the line was Cepero de la Rivera. Right. And she married when, when she was 11. And I, I, I thought that, that, that it had to be wrong, that it couldn't be possible. But now that you said that, today, I'm like, all right, I guess. She was 11 years yeah. old when she got married in, in Guinea. Wow. Yeah, the, the Cepero is a very, you know, very old family from, from, I mean, I think they were, they were with the Conquista. Um, so they're yeah. a very old distinguished family from Havana. Um, so it yeah. could be that, you know, she was, you know, it was one of those advantageous marriages, you know. Well, actually, there's a note on the marriage it says parentesco de tercero con cuarto grado con sanguinidad. So, right. Francisco, so, I'm guessing it's tercero and she's cuarto. So, uh, I'm guessing that his grandpa was the sibling of one of her great grandparents. That's what I figured right. from here. Yeah. Right. But I, yeah, she was 11 and he was in his 30s. So, yeah. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, and you. Uh -huh. You found that expediente? No, no, I, I didn't even know that there was just thing as an expediente because I actually have one line in Guinness that is very endogamous. Um, just to give you a quick idea here, um, it's through my, so it's my paternal grandfather's my paternal grandmother, her dad, Don Joaquin Lopez y Ferradas. So his, um, Paternal grandparents were first cousins because both of their dads were siblings from Guanabacoa. The line is Lopez Añasco. But then their moms were una era tía de, like she was the aunt, the aunt of the other one. So they're like double cousins. And then also on the mom's side, uh, of the, the maternal grandparents were Ferrada del Pino and Pino y Franco. Again, the mom of Ferrada del Pino was the, the daughter, or the, the, the sister of of the dad of Pino Franco. So it's like, he's like quadruple cousins there. And oh, they all say obviously you. second degree and it's a mess. Like I was shocked when I saw that, that yeah. just like one line, like the Cepero line through that great, great grandmother of mine is represented like in four instances. Yeah. Yeah. It, that was very common with, with these, um, particularly the, these elite families. Um, you know, they wanted to keep the names. They would, you know, marry with each other. And so that, you know, it doesn't surprise me. If it's Guinness, you said it's 1700s. If it's 1700s, they might not have it because I think they start. Yeah, it's 1700s. It's 1700s. Yeah. And what, what's interesting is that usually the, the lines from like that were coming from Spain were the ones that added a little bit of diversity because otherwise they were just marrying in between cousins in Cuba. Yeah. So, yeah. That was pretty much it. I just wanted to, yeah, I've seen it. I've seen it. That is, um, wow. It's, yeah. it's very, very common. And, you know, and, and it, it's in more than one great, great grandparent. I have uh, my maternal, and we were just talking about that today, actually, on the Iberia genealogy thing. Um, I think Emily, who's here, she, she, we, we, me and her talked about it. My, um, my maternal grandmother's uh, maternal grandparents, were something similar. The mom of the uh, maternal granddad was the aunt of the mom of the maternal grandmother. So there were 
something we are like that too. I don't even know what that yeah. is, but yeah. But perhaps these records are in, in some archive somewhere, you know, in, in Spain. Yeah, yeah. I would think. You know. Uh, yeah, I um, I, I hope so. It's it's kind of yeah. interesting. Uh, there Perhaps. also one one thing, if I may, uh, because I also ran into that, and uh, me and and Sergio talked on the side about this. Is there seems to be missing records from Guanabacoa in the time period of seventeen forty three to about uh -huh. seventeen sixty. There's like a a, a, yes. a hole there. I have a lot yeah. of ancestors who marry in that critical time period. And I've, I've hit uh, sort of roadblocks because- I Yeah, those are missing. Those are unfortunately missing. Um, the, book, the book says, the marriage book in Guanabacoa says 1715 to 1768, but it, it ends in 1750, 1744. So there's about eight, 20 years that are, that are missing. Yeah. Do you know whatever happened to that? Does, does um, I think it was know lost. I think it was lost. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's awful. Yeah, there was a Sergio, or I think it was Sergio, had an expediente. So he was forced, so he found the expediente and it says that that marriage, um, even though it gave him the date, it says that the book that it was originally from was lost. You know, it might've been the, the, the British occupation in 1762, um, which also affected some of the parish books in Guanabacoa, um, because Guanabacoa was particularly, um, what was attacked by by the british it was kind of kind of the site of one of the major battles um and so i know yeah. that one of the one of the books or, or like at least four or five years are are not there and the pair the, the baptism book yes. said it's because of that um yes you're right uh baptism i believe is like there there's so missing baptisms too yeah the, 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 book, um, the book says the book tells you so Perhaps that's the same thing with the marriage records that, you know, something happened with the British. Damn, man, the British screwed us up. Yeah. <laughs> and they were like, come away. They burned the, 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 the town and like, they burned a lot of the books there too. Yeah. The pirates, uh, yeah, it's awful. Damn. So Rich, I had one question. So have you seen, I've heard about, you know, young brides, mm -hmm. um, but then they would go live with that groom's family, but they weren't, they weren't living in a house on their own. So I guess if an 11 year old had children when she was 12 or 13, that would disprove that, that theory. Right. But I heard, I heard that they were like get promised and be married like a child bride, but then they would go somewhere else. They wouldn't just go live with the husband right away. It was, they waited till she was 15 or 16. I don't remember the details of that story. If, if you've ever right. heard of anything about that. that. No, that, that was actually much more common. You know, that that's, you know, when I talked about the nine-year-old, um, you know, she was kind of like uh, signed off, but she was it, was, it was an esponsal that they signed. The esponsal was kind of like the promissory note, like, you know, we okay. the contract, you, you know, you have to marry, we have to, you have to marry me kind of thing. Right. That's usually what happened. Um, with Sandor, you know, the 11-year-old, that might have been what happened, you know, like they, you know, perhaps they, you know, she was married, but then, you know, they didn't live together. I had one that was married at, you know, at, at 13, 14. Um, and she started to have kids quite soon after. So, you know, like 16, she had a child. So, um, yeah, but I, I would think that that young, you know, nine or 10 years old, they wouldn't have, um, you know, it, it would be something that was, you know, monitored by, by family members. So we have a question from Emily. Mm -hmm. If she could unmute. I'll just, yes, okay. I just muted myself. Okay, thank thank you. you. I have a question and a, and a couple of comments. Um, I'll just make a, co a couple of comments really quickly. Um, the Catalan had uh, some naming conventions that were a little bit different, I think, from the rest of Spain. So when you talk about the earliest records that we have and women kind of changing their name back and forth in different ways or, or being recorded in different ways. I wonder if um, if it had anything to do with who the priest was and where the priest came from. And that's just that's just a, a 
off the wall kind of comment that I just wonder if it has to do anything, anything with that. And it's something to look at the name of the priest and see if maybe some of the priests were Catalan because they had a very specific uh, way of naming women at certain times. Um, the other thing I was going to um, mention is also in Catalonia that it was very common for a man who had lost his wife to also marry a woman, of course, who's lost her husband. But mm -hmm. then one of the ways that they got around the issue of the very expensive dowries and everything else is that the son of one would marry the daughter of the other. So you kind of would have double wed weddings, which were either at, at on the same day, or you might have the wedding um, take place maybe a year later or two years later or whatever. You would also have, what I also found is a lot of cases in which families would marry two siblings to two other siblings in the family. And so if you marry um, your son to this young girl and then your daughter to the girl's brother, then that reduces the dowry that the families have to pay. Uh, I don't know if that made any sense or not, but... Oh, absolutely. Yeah. There okay. Were... And I, well, I'm assuming that that also happened in Cuba because, I mean, well, everything else that I have heard is exactly what I have found in Catalonia. Yeah, there were all kinds of different ways to get around, you know, or, or to at least, you know, mitigate... Alleviate, yeah. Yeah, some, some of the costs for sure. And, and you know, that was... There were different strategies that were used, and that you know that that was certainly one of them. Um, um, then I want. The, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The Catalan priest. So I want to see this chart. So this chart, and this is from a book. Um, this is done by Alejandro de la Fuente, who's a professor okay. at Harvard. There's a great book called Havana and the Atlantic in the 16th Century, um, which is a a really good book and it, it does talk some about marriages and, and, and dowries and, and really kind of the early history of Havana and so he says here so two point very small percentage very yeah small percentage um, at least at this time and in Havana right so that's yeah 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 I, I noticed that the percentage from Catalonia at that time was very small so then um, the other thing I wanted to mention is um, that I had been, I'm very glad to hear that some of the expedientes are in churches. Um, I had heard that all of the expedientes were in either La Habana in the Arzobispado or in the whatever the archives in historical archives, or that they were in Santiago de Cuba and kind of like the where the island had been kind of like split in two and all the expedientes were supposed to have been sent to one end or the other end and i am glad to hear that that's not the case um because that gives another possibility of searching how common is it in your in your travels to have found actually expedientes there i, I really thought that all of the expedientes had been collected or pretty much no, i mean no, this is just all but the Archbishop does have, obviously, they do have quite a few expedientes, but a place like Matanzas, they're all there. Wow. So, yep. Now, they're there starting about 1800. So perhaps the Archbishop might have them from before 1800, but I, 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 I don't think so. Um, okay. Yeah, Matanzas has, has a lot of them. Okay, the other thing I was going to mention is my understanding is that if somebody married a peninsular, they would have to also have an expediente. Is that correct? Um, not that I'm aware of. If if he was a military man, then then yes. Um, because they had to have because you know without you know electronic records and everything else. I mean somebody comes into the country and they my understanding was that they had to document the fact that they were eligible to marry that they were either single or or their wife had died or husband had died whatever so they would have to have that documentation is that was my understanding and of course i could be wrong i mean i just i just pick up whatever i hear and mm -hmm. yeah i mean it could it could be i didn't find anything on that but it, it very i mean it makes sense that they would have an expediente for that. 
Okay, because that, that's in, that would be an excellent source if that's the case, if that's true, that we could, you know, another possibility there for, for a lot of more expedientes, not just the, um, uh, the, the um, dispensaciones de consanguinidad and, and, you know, and whatever, and affinity. The way, so. the way to know that for sure would be to, you know, have access to, to expedientes in, you know, in some of these churches, is to kind of see what, what types of marriage unions were documented. Okay. Uh, All right. Well, thank you. So I will you, unmute myself. Thank so you. Emily, to follow up with Emily's question, Rich, yeah. if, if you ask, if you contact a parish yourself or you have a researcher, how do you, how do you know that there could be an exped, expediente book at that church as well? It's like, how do you make sure that your researcher or yourself is asking for that right, the right the information when you're looking for a, that record um unfortunately there there's not much information on which churches have expedientes that i have found so just um, you should just ask <laughs> you have to ask um you know the, the archives of of like certain certain you know books that we're familiar with like the archives of cuba by by lou perez or some other sources you know, will tell you this church has baptisms from this year, from that year, but they don't really talk about expedientes. So there's no list, master list that I know of that tells you which churches have expedientes. It's you just have something to ask. It's, yeah, I mean, the ones that I know, it's because I be because of my experience and I've been there and I've, you know, made a mental note of which of which ones have them. Um, but they are, they're definitely um, treasure troves for sure. So we have a question from Neva. If she um, would like, uh -huh. How do you find a researcher in Cuba in the different areas? Um, Is Nina Hansen on the call? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, there, there is, a, there is a, a, um, a member of the club that, uh, on, are, are you, have you liked the Facebook page, the, the Cuban Genealogy <laughs> Facebook page? Eva? Yes, I have. Okay. There um, is a, a lady by the name of, of Nina Hansen that um, has some of that information on researchers. Okay, great. What, what, okay. Areas, what areas are you looking for? Uh, actually, I'd, I'd have to look, but oh. I, I have two or three Cuban lines. My, my grandmother was born in La Havana. San Antonio de los Monos, uh -huh. and she, her line originated from, um, I guess, a Creole woman, because that shows in the DNA. So from what you, I've heard today, it could have possibly been a military marriage. Mm -hmm. um, I what also had- What year, Neva? Uh, my grandmother? Yes. Uh, she was born in 1916. Okay. And, um, but it, it, it goes back a little ways. But I know because of the mitochondrial DNA that someone was a Creole. So, and then um, she came, her family are the ones who came from Pinar del Rio. But I also have um, several other areas that family came from. I, I don't think I'm from the elites on this side of the family. Right. right. Um, Brian, do you know anything about Pinar del Rio? Um, I have a researcher. If you, I'll put my email address in there. If you want to email me, I can check with my researcher to see if, if Pinal de Rio is a possibility. That's kind of like the Wild West, and it's, yeah, it's literally. kind of, it's kind of difficult. I, I can tell you that San Antonio de los Baños has beautiful records, and I think they also have expedientes. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. you had mentioned San Antonio de los Baños, right? Yes, that's yeah. where my grandmother was born. Okay, so that that was on the outer Havana province, which is now by Abeque province. Um, so they definitely have a they have a great 
very organized system there. And I think, I think they also have expedientes in that church. Okay, and my mother was also born there. Oh, so, oh. so I could get her birth certificate or birth registration from there too. You have birth, birth date? Um, I don't have it memorized, but... Um, with the so year, you can find it. Yeah, with the year, you would just need a, a researcher to go there. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, great. Um, so do you want, where are you gonna put your email at? I just put it in the chat to everyone, digitalcuba.org. Okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, and we'll put you in contact with um with the researcher from from that area. Okay, if I'm, I'm sorry, if I may add something, sometimes I think it's better, it's relatively easier to get a baptism um certificate than a civil record. This is what I've heard from some people. Others might have a different experience, but you might want to consider that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, definitely, definitely. I concur with that, Emily, but it just depends. Um, you know, I've had luck with civil registries, um, but it, it is definitely easier to, to obtain something from a church and it's easier for your researcher who's there to obtain something from a church. I want them both. I you want, them both. You I get want them. the church, I want, I want as, much, as many records as possible. Yeah. Yeah, that, what I want is that also and one of my other lines that came over from Cuba was a um, a um, Rivera uh -huh. and I'm I'm roadblocked on him or brick walled on him and I can't find where he came from and I'm using the uh, DNA to try and find where he came from yeah the, the dna is tricky you know yeah it's really uh kind of a tool you use once you've done some research on your you know once you have the the paper trail um because it you know and the dna changes you know what, what it says you are one one month you know you'll have something different the next month um but where, do you know have any idea where he's from in Cuba? No, not this one. But I do know um, that some of my relatives are from the Canaries um, because my DNA cousins, several of them, their families come from the Canaries. But I think because of the endogamy, um, that's making the um, it's making it harder to find the um the paper trail and stuff yeah and and this gentleman is your what re, what relation is he to you he would be my great grandfather okay yeah so i would i would start with your mother and just work back yeah that's what i've done and then you'll find it you'll once you get to your grandmother you'll definitely you'll find some information on him okay great <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm going through the questions to see if there's any left. Um, one thing I wanted to say, Rich, have you seen any doc, any last name changes where maybe someone pulled in a last name because a grandparent had kind of more of more of a prestigious last name than yes, so that, that you kind of use that to your advantage to so you have to have an open mind. Yeah, that was very common in the Canaries. So for, for those of, of us that you know done research with canary island ancestors it was very common i mean it was actually probably more the rule <laughs> to switch up your last names you know more so around the 17 you know from 1800s on back um you you know you would pick the name that you wanted to pick usually the more prestigious name but that was very very common practice particularly in the canary islands which makes it very confusing when you're when you're doing research and a lot of um, a lot of children would take their mother's um, name. That was quite common in the Canaries. 
So Sandor, do you have another question or anyone else want to raise their hand? Otherwise I'll try and see yeah. if there's any questions in the chats. I, I, I do. Okay. Um, it actually has to do uh, with the line that I have a military record since that was brought up. Um, I have an ancestor who, whose son, I uh, actually found him by sheer block. I was looking through the books of San Jose where I'm from and uh, he, he, he died there at 42. What's interesting is his dad, Francisco Rosellon, was in the military. And then when you look at his marriage record in Guanabacoa with the lady of last name Diaz Pages, um, the dad, you could see him rising in the rankings. By the time he passed away at age 42, the dad was an Alfred de Fregata. No, wait, hold on. He was an Alfred de Fregata, which I think is a ship, when he got married and when he died, he was a Teniente de Regimiento. And the problem is Cayetano, it just says that he's from Ciudad La Habana, which in the 1780s, there's plenty of church, so it's become kind of a nightmare for me to try to figure out which one he could have possibly been from. So I read online on the Cuban genealogy side that there are some records, or there's like this uh, in Segovia, in Spain, for people who were in the military, where they documented the marriages, because ultimately, if I find Francisco Rosellon married this lady, Maria Isabel Borras, which is also, both of them have Catalan last name, so I was curious about that. Uh, have you heard anything about that? Marriage records for the military people, especially he seems to have been in the Navy. Um, yes, I, I don't know if I can remember off him the, where, what particular record it was, but it was definitely, let me see here. I have it here. Three. Three. In fact, I think there's something on the Cuba Gen website related to these military records. Something Segovia, right? Yeah, I can't remember offhand, but you might want to Google like Segovia military, militar. Archivo, perhaps, and see if something comes up. And and on either I the did, I did. Um, you found it. I, I believe you have to go there in person, though. I don't think they have a digitized copy of it. Oh. And I, I tried one time. I went to Spain for a week, but you know I didn't have a lot of time to be going. Yeah, the Archivo General Militar de, Se de Segovia. Yeah. And uh, it's not on Paris. I've always, Excuse I've always had the best lot looking in Paris. Yeah. I have yeah, gotten. I find it difficult. I just wanted to pipe in that I have gotten records from um, Segovia, military records from Segovia, by requesting it just by emailing them. Oh, but that was before. Okay. But, but that was before the COVID. Okay. Okay. I don't know if they're. I don't. I don't think they are going to be open right now, but but Spain is opening up, uh, so you might be able to wait a few weeks or a couple of weeks or something and, and be able to request it. Yeah, I see a phone number here. Okay. Um, so you can probably even call or, or uh, email. Okay. Thank you for sharing that. Is that Emily? Who shared that? Somebody shared that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I believe that was Emily. No, I mean that, that was Emily, yeah. Thank you, Emily. Sure. Felicia, do you have a question? I, I think I missed your hand raised earlier. If you want to unmute, and then we'll do Beth. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. My question is this. I have a great-grandfather uh, who was married to a governor's daughter uh, during the independence, the War of Independence. <clears throat> she unfortunately became ill and passed away. His second marriage, he remarried my great grandmother. So my question is, I have two questions. Would uh, he be able to, from what you've, your experiences, would he be able to remarry in the church since he was a widower? I'm, I'm trying to find their marriage certificate. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so start with the church before I do the civil part. Yes, I would start with the church. Um, what, about what year was it? Uh, this is during the War of Independence? Uh, she passed away, the first wife, during the War of Independence. Yeah. My great-grandmother was quite a bit younger than him. So um, I'm going to say, I don't know, uh, 18, 
1870s maybe i don't know 18 i don't know i don't really know i don't know the exact time frame i'd have to have my aunt tell me yeah but, it was probably if it was after if, if this woman died in the war of independence it was probably after the 1898 i would yeah. say yeah okay yeah she had cholera and she became ill and she passed away so i should start with the church you think yeah definitely start with the church now, with the, in, on an ex, my second question is, with an expediente, um, does that just give you uh, dowry information, or does it also give you family information? Like, it gives I'm, you all kinds of information. It gives you, sometimes it'll have the, the, the baptismal, copies of the baptismal certificates. Sometimes there'll, there'll be copies of baptismal certificates for the couple's parents, the couple's grandparents. Sometimes there'll be genealogical trees on there. So not all of them but some some of them have that information in and there. do you think from your experience um marrying a governor's daughter that that would have been something that might exist in this particular couple's case i mean no guarantees but i'm just wondering you mean if there was a an expediente yeah um quite possibly okay. yeah quite possibly particularly if she was really young you know. I would like to pipe in on that one, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, sorry. Um, I don't know about the practice in Cuba, but in Catalonia, couples had capítulos matrimoniales, okay. which were like prenuptial agreements. Okay. I don't know if you have seen any of those in Cuba. Um, and basically, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't give you a family tree, which an expediente does, but a capítulo matrimonial basically lists everything that the, that the bride is contributing, or the, or the husband, or the father of the bride is contributing to, to the couple, and everything that the groom is contributing to the couple. What happens in case that one of them dies? Uh, how much of what is returned to which family and so on and so forth. I don't know if you've seen those in Cuba. Yeah, I have not seen those in, in Cuba. Okay. okay, thank you. I'll, I'll check it out. <laughs> Beth, Beth, would you like to unmute yourself? Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great, I have a ancestor who um, on his birth certificate, the mother is not listed, just his father, and he never carried his mother's apogito with him um, throughout his life either. Uh, would there be a reason for this? Like, um, wow. have you heard of, heard of that as far as, I mean, were the parents, it said he was legitimate as well. Uh, and it doesn't say that she died in childbirth? No, and, uh, and the son was born after the father had died so like the birth certificate was i think filed years later to to show um uh, to make some kind of claim i think on a i don't know something on on the estate or something i can't remember but um we just can't figure out why the mother is not mentioned anywhere have you seen the original the original? Uh, no, just just what uh, the researcher in Cuba was able to get for me, which they they handwrite everything down, they transcribe it. So I haven't seen the original. The, the document that the researcher found is from is is was from when he was born, or this is or it was drawn up after the father had passed away, kind of. I think after the father has passed away, uh, I'm trying to find it really quick to clarify, but. Um, so it, it may have been, if it was drawn up after, um, it may have been that they just needed the father's information on there. I've never seen anything like that ever. Um, yeah, well, and on, on his children's birth certificates, when they list, you know, how it'll list what the father's name is, right. they only say Francisco Mindiando. They never mention what his second apposito is, even though they mention his wife's and the children and everything, um, and the grandparents, even his parents were given the two last names, but him, just that one name. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you, you might want to try to locate the original, what, where, what area is this? Is this Matanzas, and it was in Carlos Rojas, was this the town? Carlos Rojas, okay, yeah, that's, um, yeah. Um, I would try to locate the original document. I, I have requested and received documents from Carlos Rojas. 
Mm -hmm. I, the research researcher there. Um, so I would try I, to find the original entry. Is see. there any? I'm I'm sorry. Is yeah. there any chance? Is there any chance that the mother was uh, a, a criolla or pardo or anything like that? Because I have heard of something like that happening where um, a parent was not the mother was not mentioned to make the child white. Uh, the mother. Oh. Yeah, that's possible. That's okay. possible. Um, but that but because this document was drawn up after the fact it seems like this that what uh, emily that that strategy was employed after the fact i think when the child was born there has to you know pro probably this this person was trying to buy their freedom what, what year is this from uh he was born 1839 okay and yeah so it might have been done that document might have been drawn up you know retroactively to try to um to to try to present it in court to try to make himself white you could be legally huh. declared you could be you could legally change your race in court um especially I, if we're you know of mixed parentage i have an but, academic source for that i'm going to look for the book and okay. then i will type it in the chat box if i find okay. the book great thank you but but Something tells me that the original entry, if you go to Carlos Rojas, 18, I actually have one of my great, you know, one of my ancestors from 18, born in 1840 was from Carlos Rojas and I obtained oh, her, okay. yeah, her certificate and it was in good shape. So I would try to obtain the actual or have somebody go into the book, into that book for the original partida because the, I, I think the mother's, name has to be on that like when the child is born or baptized you know at least they have to list i've never seen them not list the mother's name you know if it's a document that's drawn up later you know kind of like this this is the copy of your baptismal certificate then they can omit that because you know because it's it's more advantageous for for that person to deny the fact that he has you know perhaps um mother of color okay mm -hmm. Okay, that's good to know. So, would there would, would there have been uh, marriages if it was if it was so? This the father was from France. Um, would were marriages registered to to people of color? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, they usually had in this case, it might be entered in either book because they you know they had two separate books, one for essentially whites and one for um, non-whites. So. But in the case of a mixed parentage like that, that you know, the child could probably could appear in either one. So you okay. might want to make a note of that, and when you know, when you have a researcher go there, you know, tell them that to, to look in both. Okay. Oh, we have another. Leia, do you have another question? You yes, I have another okay. question. So, um, Brian, um, Dan, uh, Richard, I know you said you had uh, research in Can in the Canary Islands. Have mm -hmm. you done any research in Mateo, Islas Canarias, or Vegas de San Mateo? Uh, yes, that's where my grandfather's from, and all of all of my dentist people is from there. Yes, oh. I have. In fact, done a lot of research there. Oh, okay. You know, I have an ancestor that I can't locate coming in from Cuba, but I have his descendants and some of an, an idea, and I just can't locate whether it is the birthplace of San Mateo, Islas Canarias, or is Vega de San Mateo, Gran Canaria. So, so Vega de San Mateo is the kind of the official name. Um, oh, okay. But, but they just call it San Mateo. But yeah, Vega de San Mateo is the kind of like the longer name. Oh, okay. So yeah. you may have someone that could potentially look into, or no, is that yeah. something you do? I don't, I don't have a re yeah, I do. I have a researcher there. Um, and what, what year are we talking? Okay. Uh, the descendant that was born in San Nicolas de Bari was around, it was exactly in 1878. So I'm thinking this person might have been born like 1853 to 1860. Okay. Um, yeah, you can, you can, 
call, perhaps call them. You might get lucky that way, like you just calling the church in San Mateo. Um, I think they only allow people to do research there. It's like once a week. I think it's like okay. on Fridays that they, they, but don't quote me on that. I think it's Fridays that, they're, that the archive is open. Um, but yeah, oh. yeah, I know okay. a researcher there. I have some indexes from there, but not from that time period. I have some death indexes from later, like late, really late 1800s and early 1900s. Oh, okay. And yeah. uh, do you happen to know the name of the church? I, it kind of took me a little while to figure it out. Um, I'm sure I can look it up, but yeah, if you just type in Parroquia de San Mateo, it'll come oh, up. Okay. okay, thank you. And and there's only one. Okay. It's a beautiful church. Yeah, it, they have and their records are kept perfectly. You won't have a, oh. a you know you just gotta like get it. <laughs> you know you have to have a researcher go in there and, and, and get it. Okay. Yeah. You put your information uh, in the chat. Oh, I have one more question. Um, are you guys looking for people to help out this summer uh, on your trip to Cuba? Um, all of that is up in the air. Okay. <laughs> That's what I know. I'm just wondering. <laughs> yeah. No, we are. But we are. Oh, yeah. But um, it, I don't know what I'm going. I mean, Brian, do you have any? I, I don't know. The situation keeps changing. I, if I was Cuba, I don't know. I mean, are they going to let us in? We're from Florida. <laughs> you know? I don't well, know. I'm, te I'm technically huh? Cuban with a Cuban passport, so. <laughs> no, I mean because of COVID. No, I, I, yeah. I go in easily. And normally, it's just with, with COVID, everything is so right. not normal, you know. Um, so I was going to okay. go in August, but I think I'm going to have to postpone that. You know? Okay. Yeah. All right. Sounds yeah. good. Just wondering. We will be doing some transcription training on Zoom if you want to try that before you, you know, yes. to help out with the transcription part. We'll do an announcement about that. We won't, we won't announce it on, I don't really want to announce it on Facebook per se, because I don't want everyone to know that we're transcribing. But if you want, you could send me an email and we can add you to that, to that private Zoom. Absolutely, yes. And that, that would help us a lot to get these indexes. You know, we want the indexes to, so we can search for our, for our ancestors. So, yes. Thank you so much. You're did, Emily, did you have another question? Oh, maybe not. I Anybody? think I, think I oh. made, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. I think I made my comment about uh, the reason for that. Um, a possible reason why the mother is missing. I put some. I put some sites uh, there. Actually, I think it's the third book that I that I mentioned in my in my list, not the first two. Um, I think that's where I read it, because I I don't think I've gotten far into one of these books, or or actually one and a half. Of it's got to be that last book that I that I listed. Oh, sexual crucible. I yeah, racial crucible, right? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. Racial crucible. I have yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, great. Okay. I think it's in there that I saw that, um, and then I have these other two books that I actually have been, you know, looking at but not really read thoroughly. Yeah. That uh, might group. help for my project. Yeah, the the Asuncion Lavern group is a classic. It's considered a like a, a classic. So that's another great one. Yeah. Thank you but I sure. think that it's in that other one about the, the, the racial crucible that I yeah. saw that example. Thank you. Okay. Neva, did you have another question? Or did I, did I un... Maybe she's asked her question. Uh, right? Yes. Oh. Um, my other question is, does Spain and the Canaries have um, passenger lists of people who went to Cuba? Um, well, uh, from, from what I know, the um, most extensive work that's been done on that is on Cuba Gen Web. On that, have you been to that site? Not yet. Yeah, so Cuba Gen Web has a list of, uh, like a database of passengers who came over from, from those areas that were t extracted from Diario de la Marina, which was a famous newspaper that usually printed 
who came in and out. Um, okay. So you, you might find it on there. I think he has over 330,000 entries. So you might find it on there. Other than that, um, and I know Cuba has them, um, but that's really tricky to get. Those are hard records to get. Um, yeah. I have been successful. I know where they are. They're in the Archivo Nacional in mm -hmm. a basement. Um, and they're there, but they're very tricky to get um, for some reason. Okay. And yeah. then uh, I would like to be added to um, the two Zoom meetings, the one on uh, the the transcription and the um, uh, cemetery Cologne, because my great great grandmother is, or my great grandmother is buried there, or was in yes, the so artist we're... section. So we, we can certainly add to that. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Neva. <laughs> Any final questions? I think I saw someone say something about Archivo Nacional, but you just, to, to do research there, you have to be a registered researcher, correct, Rich? Yes, uh, the Archivo Nacional de Cuba, yes. You have to be a registered researcher, um, which means that you usually have to have the backing of some institution. Um, so, you know, for instance, um, like the Cuban History Institute, or there's another foundation known as the uh, uh, Nunez Jimenez Foundation. Um, there are kind of different ways you can become a re registered researcher, but, it, but it's tricky. Okay. Rochi, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, hi, there, Rich. Oh, hi, Rochi. But there are a lot of people that are, that will, research for you as well. That's another option. Yes. Hi, Rochi. Hi. Um, okay, my question is, looking through my mom's, uh, my mom uh, passed away recently, I found, and I had some idea of my grand, great grandmother. Um, she died soon after my grandmother uh, was born. So, and my grand, great grandfather remarried. Her name was Rosa, no, Oliva Lambert. And then I just recently found a, 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 a picture and it's, um, it's my, my grandmother writes in the back, sending this picture to her grandmother. All this is news to me. And she was Rosa Lambert, Viuda de Lambert. So I have a, a, a I guess they were um, family. Cousin, yeah. Um, right, but, they were, okay, but... They were cousins, sounds right, like. Uh, right, and the address is Baracoa, Calle Los Galanos. So my, my question is, I always thought she had come from, this was the story I got, she had come from um, Haiti uh, of French descent. Right. And, um, but now her, let's see, her mother, this is my great grandmother, her mother, which would be my great great grandmother, is Lambert Viuda Lambert. Which, uh, okay, I'm not gonna imply anything. Do you have any information on Baracoa files or records? Uh, you know, on the eastern part of the island, um, I, I don't, I don't have much experience with that. But I mean, certainly. That, you know, that there's a lot of French uh, names over there. That's where, you know, okay. everyone who, who left Saint-Domingue in the 1790s and onward, they went, you know, usually ended up in the, in that eastern part of the island. Um, but there has to be, I mean, there has to be the, the parish there. Or, Brian, or you, or is anyone familiar with the parish in Baracoa? Mm -mm. I mean, the, it, there, there has to be. Um, you know, which means there's there's a good chance that that record is there. Right. I, I have I have done some research on the city, just basically the city, because I didn't go into the yeah. parishes or anything, which is my question. And yeah. um, Baracoa back in the 1800s was a, a main city. Yeah. Yeah. It was one of the first. It was the first city actually founded. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so so Grochi, I can 
find out that that's that should be easy to find out at least what the parish is um and then it's a question of either calling you know you might have luck I, i've had luck calling sometimes okay. Um, okay. or hiring a researcher in that in those parts you know and it is it's isolated um, but hiring somebody there to find that document you know and okay you so you do have information i'm sorry do you, you do have um knowledge of um uh french or um also portuguese i think um, yeah well the french the, the the yeah i mean the french that's where they ended up you know the 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 white french when they when they bailed from San Domingue, they ended okay. up most of them in santiago but you know most of them ended up in the or i should say most all of them ended up in the eastern part of the island so that makes perfect sense. Yes. Um, and that record has to, you know, it sounds like it could be a cousin, you know, they, they were first cousins, but right. that record, you know, it's very likely in the parish church of Baracoa. Now, okay. just because the, the address said Baracoa doesn't mean that she was born in Baracoa. So. You know. Right. That, that's my question. That is. Right. But. Where I want to, what I want to find out. I mean, I would recommend you start first with your you know, low hanging fruit and find your, where your grandmother, find your grandmother's certificate. Okay. Because okay, your great. grandmother's certificate will likely have not only her parents, but her great grandparents. Because by the time your grandmother was born, they were usually putting already grandparents' names on there. All right, she so, was born in 1895. Yeah, by that point they were putting, they were listing grandparents. So, do you, where, you know, find, where, where was your grandmother born? My mom, my grandmother was born in Baracoa. Oh, in Baracoa, for, like for mm -hmm. sure. Okay. Yes, for sure, okay. for sure. Okay. okay, so then, yeah, so then that record should be there. Okay. Roshi, this, your grandmother with last name Oliva um, was born in Baracoa? That's what I, I don't know. That. My grandmother, no, my grandmother is Oportuna Cueto. Oh, okay. So her father you... was Francisco Cueto. Her mother, her mother was oliva lambert oh okay i have an oliva line and it's actually uh in uh guara la habana so i don't know if that's helpful to you but i'm still kind of like a little bit on a dead end there oh okay Guara. so check it out it's it, and it is actually a little bit of a um i, I believe they're a little bit french too so i'm i'm debating i think there's some portuguese maybe um I'm not 100% sure, but if you want my email, I can post it in there. Maybe we oh, can. Oh, great. Yes, thank you. I would appreciate that very much. So, email on the chat? Yes, yes. Was, okay. was that Iris that just said that? No, I'm Leia. Oh, well, I Leia. Oh, because I know Iris has a lot from, from Guada. So, yeah. I think we do match up, Iris. Uh, so, I will definitely. <laughs> So Guara, um, we know, we definitely know those records are there. So, because we- Oh, excellent. Um, yeah, yeah, kind Harris, of a yeah, we both been there. So the, I know those records are, are kept well. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you this has been very good helpful. helpful. Good to thank talk you. to you. Good to hear your I voice. I know, I know. <laughs> Beth, do you have one, another question? And I, I think we're probably going to be done. Yes, I just, since you have gotten records from Carlos Rojas before, uh -huh. I'm looking at that birth record, and it does look like it was made when he was born, and it says that the father um, declares himself as father as one of the clauses in his will, because the father died that year the son was born. Okay. Is that, do, do you know, just from that area, is that something easy to obtain, this, this will? Does that indicate the parents probably were not married? Um, it might very well be. Um, that will um, might be in the Archivo Historico Provincial is where I have found wills for my people in Matanzas. So that's just something to keep in mind. I know I'm throwing a lot out at you and everybody. Okay. But, um, Can you say the name of that again? The Archivo Histórico Provincial de, Ma de, de Matanzas. 
and that is located in the city of Matanzas, um, you're, you're, it's going to be easier for you. Oh, so that, if that's the document then that, that was drawn up when the child was born, that just sounds really strange to me that, you know, right. <laughs> off that the mother's not put on, you know, irrespective of race. Um, but I'm going to look at, at that, the book that Emily suggested to see if I can find something else uh, as, as to that. I, I've never heard of that phenomenon. Um, but as far as a will, um, that Archivo Historico Provincial probably has it. Okay. Yeah. Okay, that's great to know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll keep looking into it then. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. think that might be it. If anyone wants to unmute, if I missed your raised hand, you could unmute now if you have any questions. Thank you, everyone. We'll be posting some more. I think Rich wants to do another, another presentation in a, in a month or so, or? Yeah, we'll probably do something on, on Spanish immigration to Cuba. Wow. Yeah, we Would have, that be covering the Canary Islands? Yes, definitely. I mean, it's Cuba. <laughs> we have to. We're, we're all Canary. Well, I'm talking, I should say the smaller islands. I, I've been always told that my, fam, my mom's family came from Lanzarote. Can't prove that yet, so. Yeah, well, I'll, I'm going to talk, you know, really more about the history of it and kind of how, you know, how the Spanish, you know, spread out in Cuba, different years that they came. There were years when people from certain islands you know, certain ones of the Canaries came, um, you know, for different re for varying reasons. So yeah, well, I'll definitely look and, and find some stuff on Lanzarote for you. All right, perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again for a wonderful presentation. You're welcome. Thank and, you. And also find other sources. Um, I mean, there's so much when you think of, of everything in the history. I have found, so once I I found out where my grandfather was from because he was a mystery for a long time. My mother's father, she didn't know him. And I found out very recently the town he was from in Pontevedra in Galicia. Um, and then I found that this colony of people from that place in Nigoy, this very small town in, in, in Galicia, came and they had their own newspaper. Um, so I found stuff on them in this newspaper that they published in, in, in Havana in the 1920s. Um, so I want to talk about that because the Spanish, um, different, different groups had different publications and whatnot that they, you know, they had on the island that can perhaps be helpful in finding other details about, about ancestors. In addition to, um, talking about where and when and why they came to Cuba. Oh, I actually have a little info on that. Um, I have an ancestor who came from Asturias and El Diario was very helpful in finding that and it's actually digitized. Um, La Gaceta de Asturias, maybe, was okay. the name of it. Yeah. So, and that's how I found his exiting from, um, from Asturias because he was missing on the, um, I guess when they call you up to go to the army and that comes up in the newspaper, the son of so-and-so it's not present at the time where you were asked to join the army. Right. So, so those yes. things were listed in, in the newspaper. <laughs> yes. So you found that in Gaceta de Asturias. Sí. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these newspapers are being digitized. So that's the good thing for us. That a lot one of is digital. It is digital. That, that, one, that one's digitized and a lot more are. I know the Las Palmas Gran Canaria newspaper was digitized. Um, so there's a lot of that. And what you just said was actually quite common. A lot of, a lot of Spaniards would bail from Spain when it came time for military service and went to Cuba. So that, you know, was something that was more common. Than, than yeah, was, late 1800s, I think. 1800s, yeah. There were a lot of wars in Spain. Spain was in, uh, there was a lot of turmoil in the 1800s. So a lot of them uh, came to so, Cuba. Mm -hmm. hi. So, hi. So was there any truth to a rumor that if you were a military in Spain that you went to Cuba because they, you were promised land or it was because you were trying to get away from Spain and not serve in the military? 
Um, well, I think there's two different things that, you know, if you were, if you were bailing because you didn't want to serve in the military, you, you weren't going to get land. You know, you were just kind of taking your chance uh, and going. Um, however, a lot of Spaniards came to Cuba because there were programs by, by the Spanish colonial government and then the Cuban Republic um, awarding lands to Spanish immigrants because they needed A, the labor, and B, they wanted to whiten the island. Um, so there was always this complejo. Cubans have always had this complejo. We've got to whiten the island. We've got to whiten the island. And so there were immigration schemes that were devised specifically to bring Spaniards to the island, um, and, and they were awarded lands. And among them was my gra the grandfather, my grandfather from San Mateo in the early 1900s came as part of that. And his brothers came, and, and, and they did very well. Of course, they were awarded land. Um, well, that's... Yeah, that's that's the rumor that's been going around in my family for a long time that uh, somebody on my mother's side was a uh, soldado and yeah. came to Cuba on the on that basis. I yeah. haven't been able to prove anything. So that's I'm stuck in there on that end. So. But you have his information, his baptismal, you have his. No, nothing. No? No baptismal, no birth records, uh, nothing. I don't even know where he, 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 he uh, I know that my mother was born in Santi Espiritus. Mm -hmm. And as far as I know, the family is from there, from that area, Las Villas. So maybe so. he died in Santi Espiritus. Mm. So like that's I said, yeah. my mother's side of the family, it's, it's a complete mystery. Yeah. Um, so if you're, if you're, that's what I would do. If you find out where, you know, you know, where your mother was, this is your grandfather you're talking about, right? Or your I'm, I'm going to say my grandfather on my mother's side. Yes. Okay. So where, where was your mother born? So that Santi Espiritus. Santi Espiritus. So he, he may have died in Santi Espiritu. Of course, that's not, you know, we're not a hundred percent on that, but he, I, I would look for that death record there and then just work back. Work your way back. Okay. All right. Did, I'll start with that. Did he marry your great grandmother in in Cuba or in Spain? <laughs> That's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. <laughs> it, it's it. Some people will say yes, he married in in, um, in Cuba. Some people were saying yes in in Spain. So. But I mean, check for a marriage records uh, in San Yeah. All right. Check Cover, cover all your bases and okay. you'll, you'll, you'll find it eventually. <laughs> I mean, it's taken me 20 years to find the grandfather that I, you know, ne we never knew anything about. I just found him this year after 20 years of, of even before I was into genealogy, I was looking for him. You know, we were right. all looking for him. My whole family, even people that aren't into genealogy, we, we were looking for him and I found him finally after 20 years. So just try cover all your, check off all your boxes. Okay. You know? All right. Yeah. Thank so you. Your, your mother's baptismal certificate should say the town he's from, at least. Uh, I don't even have that. I only have her, 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 her birth certificate. And it doesn't the civil say record. It doesn't say where he's from? Um, let me think. Hold on. Um, you know what? I'll double check because I think it does say it. So that would be, that would be a golden nugget right there. Look and okay. see what that says. And if you're lucky, hopefully it doesn't just say Asturias, you know, and, and, and it'll, it'll give you the, or where, you know, it'll, it hopefully it won't just give you like the area, the region, it'll give you a city and then you can, you know, check If it says Asturias, there's actually 11 regi uh, civil registries. Don't ask me how I know that. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think that, uh, hold on, let me see. Ooh, wait, you can actually write to the civil registries and you will, I actually do a request yeah. by mail and potentially you can get answers. So sure I did. It took me yeah. 11. So I email them and they send me records. So civil in Spain, civil registry is, is awesome. Yes. Cuba, not so much, but Spain, in Spain, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, it's, 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 it's the, it's the uh, jumping from Cuba to Spain that, that, uh, that I'm stuck in there somewhere, but yeah. Hey, will eventually something's got to give right yeah 
So, all right. Do you have any other questions? Brian, anything? I think we're good. This was yeah. an amazing, an amazing presentation, even though you did it twice. Yeah. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you all for, for coming and, and uh, keep a lookout for future, um, future uh, installments. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Thank you. All right. Thank you, thank you very much, guys. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye.